Um, and just a few minutes ago, we sort of made an example for why you might care. So let's just watch the video. And I need volume for the video. <laughs> All right, so this is a face mill in one of our mini mills downstairs. It's feeding right now, and so for our, have you guys done science before? Have you guys done science? Science or science? Science. Have you done science? Before. When we start the video again, remind me to turn the volume back on. Um, so what do you do in science when you're, when you're doing science? This is, this is actually for a lecture coming up. But what, what do we do in science? Yeah. Make observations. We make observations when? Sometimes, yeah. But, but why, why are we making observations? What's the key word? We're doing an experiment. And so this really is manufacturing science that we're showing in the video here. Because we're doing an experiment. Now the, if you already know the answer, is it really research? Because I totally knew what the answer was before I started the experiment. But I want to do this experiment to demonstrate to you guys what the answer is. So feed speed, depth of cut, those are our three or four most important um, process variables in machining processes, right? We've said that. You, s you learned that if you did the reading. OK, feed speed, depth of cut. So for our experiment, oh, this is how I got on my tangent. For the experiment, we're keeping the same feed for all of the passes. And we're keeping the same speed for all of the passes. In fact, we're feeding at 72 inches a minute. And we're spinning the spindle at 6,000 RPM, which works out to about 4,700 4, service feet per minute for that tool. It's a three inch diameter tool. Three inch diameter tool, three flutes. Um, we don't want to screw up too badly because the body of the tool costs about 600 bucks. The inserts that go in the tool cost about 20 bucks each. And the body's made out of aluminum, so if one of the inserts fails, the tool is done. In fact, it costs more to get them repaired than it does to replace them, partially because of our discounts when we buy them here at WPI. But um, all right, so feed speed, depth of cut. So if we kept the speed the same and the feed the same in our experiment, what did we vary? All right, so the first pass, the one we just watched, 10 thousandths of an inch. So 0 0.01 inches. One of the things we'll do in the class is we'll learn how to talk like a machinist or talk like a manufacturing engineer. So our depth here is 10. If a manufacturing engineer or a machinist says a number without units afterwards, they mean thousandths of an inch. So if I say it's a tenth, what do I mean? Somebody, quick. A tenth of a thousandth of an inch or a ten thousandth of an inch. So if it's six tenths, it's 0 0.0006, not 0 0.06. 0 0.06 is 60 thou. All right, so our depth here was 10 thou. And so oh, 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 were you supposed to remind me? Turn the volume back on. And you know what I'm going to do? No, I'm not going to. We might get some feedback if I stand in the wrong place. But uh, all right, back it up here. Let's just start it again at the beginning. So there's a couple things going on. I want you to listen to the spindle. And I want you to listen or watch the power meter in the lower right-hand cor corner. I'll try not to talk too much. Go. All right, so that's 10 thou. Full width of cut. 100% engagement. That's 20 thou depth of cut. Notice the spindle load went up. And now 50 thou depth of cut. So it's, a, it's an experiment, right? What are our observations from the experiment? 
Yes. What's your name? Le Leon. Liana. Um, the deeper the cut, the lower the, or the higher the spindle mode. So we observe immediately that more depth of cut gives us more spindle load. Okay, what else? Anybody observe anything else? Yeah. Um, the size of the chip is larger with the depth of cut. Oh, look at that. And if you look at the end of the video, here's the 10 thou chip, here's the 20 thou chip, here's the 50 thou chip. So yeah, the chips get larger and impact the window with more force too. You notice I was shaking when they were in the window on the last one? Yeah, chips get larger and impact the window with more force, seems like. It's probably inertia, more mass, more inertia when it hits the window. Okay, anything else that anybody noticed? Did you hear the frequency of the spindle? Yeah. Would you believe that the frequency that you hear coming off that spindle motor is directly related to the speed at which it's rotating. Yeah, because yeah, noise happens that way, right? So that frequency, the higher the frequency, the faster the RPMs. Now the programmed RPM for all of the cuts was 6,000 RPM. As the tool got into the workpiece at 50,000 depth of cut, the spindle slowed down. And, and you notice the power meter went up into the red, right? It went up above, what, where's the red on the power meter? The yellow from, can't really see it. You can't really see it, but if you, if you look here, this is 50%, this is 100%, that's 150%, that's 185%. Why do you think those are the numbers? Shouldn't it go like, shouldn't the max be 100%? Wouldn't that make more sense? It's totally for marketing. It's so that the salespeople can say, you can run this machine at 150% load all day long, and it won't hurt the machine. It's totally for marketing. <laughs> exactly. We can turn the dial all the way up to 11 on this one. Right, so, so between 100 and 150% spindle load, the Haas tells us that this machine is okay as long as it's not constantly at 150% for like seven hours in a row. If it's doing this up and down, you can be between 100 and 150%, no problem. Above 150% up to 200%, you gotta worry, be worried that something's going to break. So these are actually set to shut off at 185. So if the power hits 185%, that spindle would have stopped. It would have thrown an alarm message, it would have said whoop, whoop, danger Will Robinson, right? And it would have told us something was wrong. So, all right, let me get a better camera angle now. Now, if you want to see the stuff that's up there, you'll have to uh, be on the echo capture instead of the YouTube live. And I'll try to not drag the microphone across the floor too much. OK. All right. Feed speed depth of cut has impact on, or the depth of cut has impact on the power that it takes to spin that spindle, right? Does that make sense? When the motor is no longer able to deliver that much power, it starts to slow down. If it slow, what would happen, so I said if it slows down too much, it'll stop, right? Okay. What will that do to your part? So why does, why does it stop? Why do we have it shut down and throw the alarm? Yeah. So we don't break the tooling, so we don't break the machine, so we don't damage that spindle motor because it wants to spin at speed. Okay, so feed speed, depth of cut. Are those the only process variables in manufacturing? No? No, we, we, they're impactful partly because they control how those chips form on the edge of the tool. And they, they, they really control how the chips form on the edge of the tool, so they're important to us there for that reason. So what are, let's see, document camera. All right, so let's, for right now, 
focus on machining. And we already got feed speed depth of cut. How far over can I go? All right, so we got feed speed depth of cut. Give me some little process variables, things that the manufacturing engineer or the machinist control that will impact the quality of our parts. What else you got? Yes, Liana. The, the tooling that we choose. So let's call that tool geometry. But it's not just the geometry, right? What else does matter? What else matters? Yeah. The tool material, we'll, yeah, we'll call it material. And, and with material, let's include coatings. Oh, why, why do we put coatings on cutting tools? Anybody know? Yep. So one reason would be to change the friction coefficient between the cutting surface and the workpiece or the, the chip that's forming on the edge of the tool. Um, and you said also to help dissipate heat. Yeah. yeah, any other reason we put a coating on a tool? So I think, yeah, so you, to change the surface finish of the tool, which is going to impact its ability to, so the friction mostly, I think. What else? One more reason. Yeah. Uh, Sam. I suppose it could protect it from rust, but that's not why. And, and the carbide tooling that we use won't rust anyway. Um, why else might we put a coating on the tool? So you wanted to reduce friction and reduce friction and dissipate heat differently. You wanted to change the surface finish, which will tend to reduce friction. Why else? Make the tool more durable, or perhaps less durable. We might, might want to make the tool harder. So, so we'll change the hardness. So for durability, and it's kind of nitpicking the, the term here, but for durability, we usually mean like resistance to impact and things like that. And the bulk material usually supplies the durability of the tool, whereas the coating would increase the hardness of the tool. Um, so coating's hardness, um, friction, and maybe heat. It's, I, I'm not sure it's so much the heat dissipation as the reduced friction makes it generate less heat. Um, right, so you know they make diamond coated carbide tooling. So carbide in itself, silicon carbide, is one of the hardest materials in the world. So we'll put diamond coatings on it. In fact, the only material you can use to cut silicon carbide is diamond. So if you need to grind or cut silicon carbide, you have to cut it with diamond. Put a diamond coating on a silicon carbide tool to make it a little bit harder. What kind of materials is a diamond coated silicon carbide tool good for? Anybody? Yep. Um, so oh, you're using them to cut tensile specimens? Yeah. So what, what materials though, not, not what parts? Liana wants to cut steel. Ceramics? Uh, maybe ceramics, but typically we grind ceramics. Um, steel, yeah. You're typically not going to, yeah, yes. We'll use plated tooling for, plated tooling with diamonds on it to cut silicon carbide. Um, but there's, there's one that's out there, it's low hanging fruit, that we use diamond coated silicon carbide tools for all the time? Uh, no, not so much. Yeah. No. Yep. Aluminum, as we say, as our British friends say, right? Aluminum. So with diamond coated silicon carbide tooling or diamond coated carbide tooling, we can fill buckets with chips when we're cutting aluminum. And we should not cut steel. Anybody know why we should not cut steel with diamond coated tooling? Yes. So steel is a ferrous material, yep. 
Um, that's not the main reason, though. Yeah. Ah, no, we don't really care about the sparks. Sparks are cool, though. Sparks are definitely cool. Um, so what makes steel different from iron? Yes. Yeah, to, make, to take iron and turn it into steel, we had to have to add carbon to the iron. What's diamond made out of? Carbon. Would you believe that there's a significantly high temperature that happens at that chip tool interface? What happens to chemical reactions at high temperature, some of them? They speed up, right? So that steel part will suck all the diamond right off the tool. It will absorb it into the steel and make the steel harder. Um, and then the next pass, the tool will probably break. So we don't usually use diamond coated tools on steel. But yeah, all right, so tool material, coatings, hardness, friction, heat, yeah. So why do you use it on aluminum? Oh, because the tool will never wear out if we're cutting aluminum all day long. It, 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 so we, we do this hardness here, and it also wear resistance. All right, so feed speed, depth of cut, tool geometry, tool material, those are big ones. What else have we got? Pro process variables in manufacturing. What else we got? In machining specifically, let's start with. Anything else? You guys have started using the CAM software, right? Have you created operations yet, or is that probably not next one? Some, some of you may have finished the first one. You started the creating operations one. How about? CAM software. Is that a process variable in manufacturing? Do you know that there are literally a thousand companies that make CAM software? As machinists and manufacturing engineers, we get to choose which CAM package we want to use. It's a variable, for sure. Is it a process variable? They don't all calculate the toolpaths the same way. So, I mean, it, it really gets down to this feed speed depth of cut, the axial and radial depth of cut. Um, but yeah, CAM software. Here's a process variable in manufacturing and machining. What else? Yeah. Lubricant? Coolant or lubricant. OK, what else? What else is a process variable? What else do we get to choose? Yes? Is the workpiece material, the work piece material a process variable in manufacturing? It certainly impacts how the chips are formed. It certainly impacts our choice for feed speed, depth of cut, and tooling material. But is it a process variable? Who defines the workpiece material? Or the designer, right? So the manufacturing engineer is responsible for process variables. We'll call them PVs, process variables. The designer is responsible for design parameters. Right? The design parameters should define what the customer wants. That's the purpose of design parameters, is to tell the manufacturing engineer what it is the customer wants. So now, as, when we're doing prototyping, when we're WPI students, frequently we are the designer and the manufacturer. You'd believe that? Yeah. But we're wearing the designer hat when we pick the workpiece material. Yes? I was just going to say, what kind of CNC machine you're using? Which tool? So if we did that same cutting experiment, so I did that on a mini mill. You guys use the VM2 for your first lab. Everybody's done the first lab now, pretty much? Yeah, so you guys use the VM2 for one of the processes on that first lab. You had that big three inch diameter face mill with four inserts. And how long did it take to cut the part? Ish? Five minutes? Yeah, we did about, a, it's a pretty big part. So, if we had done the same cutting experiment on the VM2 where you, used, where you did that, you would not have noticed an increase in spindle load nor a spindle slowdown on the 50 thou depth of cut. 
you know what that tool is actually, if you go to the tooling manufacturer and, and they say, what can this tool do? Because they like to brag about what their tools can do. You know what that tool's rated for? Anyone want to guess? Maximum depth of cut? Anyone want to guess? So we saw a 50 thou pretty much stalled the mini mill spindle. I'm going to guess 100 thou. You're going to guess 100 thou. Anybody have another guess? 250, you're getting closer. 375. 375, you're getting closer. Yeah. 400. Right around there, a little bit more than that, half or 10 millimeters, which is just about a half an inch. So that tool is rated for 10 millimeters deep, 90 inches a minute through the material at 8,300 RPM. If your machine tool can generate enough what? Horsepower. So that VM2, I don't know if you noticed on the side, it says 30 horsepower vector drive. So the spindle motor there has 30 horsepower. Spindle motor in the Haas Mini Mill, about six and a half, and that's at about 4,000 RPM. So it's fallen off by the time it gets to 6,000 RPM. So we were probably four horsepower peak, horse, peak load on that part. There's a big difference, like almost almost 10 times, like eight times. So yeah. So which machine tool? So it doesn't look like it's spelled right. Did I spell which correctly? Yeah. This looks weird. Did I spell machine correctly? Okay. All right, which machine tool will you choose is an important process variable. Get the burring. Um, whether or not we do deburring. Do you mean? That's process. That's, we can add a process. So, yeah, all right. I'll put in edge break. Whether or not we do that edge break in the machine or as a secondary process. Yep. So, like, operation selection. Which, which type of operation? Um, yeah, it's not just if you want a mill or lathe. There might be more than one way in a mill that you could make the same feature. So yeah, it's operation selection, definitely. Order, in which you Order of operations. What else? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, climb versus conventional. So I'm going to put that in there. Who doesn't know what this means? Don't be shy. OK. I figured if nobody raised their hands, I didn't have to explain it. So in climb milling, all right, so what happens to make cutting happen? We remove material. That's the result of cutting. What happens to make the material get removed? Yes? Right. There's a relative motion between the cutting edge of the tool, the flute, and the material, right? And so what causes the most of that relative motion? Yep. The spindle spinning. The spindle spinning. Spinning the tool, right? So we've got a spinning tool. If we're climb milling, the rotation of the tool will tend to pull the tool into the part. Just a moment. Did it restabilize? If we're conventional milling, the rotation of the tool will tend to push the tool away from the part. So that flute, so if, if this is the edge of the part as I'm going along the, the side, so we're side milling here. If that's the edge of the part, climb milling will tend to pull me into the part. Conventional milling will tend to push me away from the part. Who's ever run an Etch-a-Sketch style machine tool? You know, with the two handles, move around. Raise your hands high. Be proud. Can you make a good circle? Yeah. It's hard to make circles on Etch-a-Sketch, right? But I, I, mean a manual, I mean a manual mill here in specifics when we're talking about climb and conventional milling. Um, typically, in a manual machine tool, we'll do a conventional milling process, which is why they call it conventional, because we had manual machine tools before we had CNC machine tools. 
So typically we'll do a conventional milling process because it's better for us when we're, so I'm manually turning a hand crank that's pushing the, work, the tool through the workpiece. That, that's, what, that's what's going on. There's a mechanical advantage, but I'm turning the crank. It's connected to a nut on the table. It's moving the table across there. So I'm manually turning that. It's better for me. It's a more stable operation when I'm doing that if the tool's trying to push me backwards, right? If the tool's trying to push me backwards, I got to try harder to get into the machine, right, to get more material removed. If the motion of the tool is trying to pull me into it, it could get away from me. Anybody use it like a, a table saw, a radial arm saw? Have you ever had, especially with ripping on a radial arm saw, have you ever had it try to pull the board away from you? Same idea. Which is why you should also conventional cut there. You should have it try to push it away from, push it back to you instead of pull it away from you. But, okay, um, where am I? Oh, in, on the other hand, climb milling mates for much more efficient chip removal. Climb milling is a better process for the physics of the process, not for the control of turning the handles. CNC machine tools can generate thousands of pounds of thrust with their servo motors that control the axes. On the CNC machine tool, as long as it's a stiff enough machine, now if you've got a, a wobbly little handmade router thing, homemade CNC machine, you might still want a conventional mill. But if you've got a stiff enough machine, you're going to climb mill because it's a more efficient cutting process. All right, um, so climb versus conventional. What else we got for process variables in machining? Yes? <laughs> As someone who owns a machine shop and has employees, I can attest that that is an important process variable. Which operator do you put on the machine? What else? All people may be created equal, but not all CNC operators. Your, your inspection would fall under one of these categories or like how you inspect your parts? And yeah, we, inspection comes next week. Oh. We don't talk about inspection. <laughs> um, so, is it a process variable? I, you know, it kind of is. So in process inspection, maybe? It's possible to do a bit of audio on the echo capture. I've stepped on the microphone at least twice now. Um, and this is like in process inspection. And so maybe frequency is more important. Uh, or is the important thing there is when, how often do you check the parts that are coming off the machine? Because you, you guys get, if we're making, well, if we're making 10,000 parts an hour, we're probably not doing a full inspection on each part as it comes off the machine. Do you believe that? In fact, we might check one part every hour to see if the parts are good. And if they're not, we might have scrapped 10,000 parts. Right? A yes? connection would also be your operator with that inspection frequency because if you yeah. have someone you can trust. Okay. Exactly. Are you stealing my table? You're totally stealing my table. Is that pizza for me? Yes, sir. No, it's, it's actually not. But if you guys want to become uh, materials or manufacturing graduate students when this class is over, they totally have pizza for lunch right at the end of this class. <laughs> all, right, um, all right, so give me some more process variables. Things that we can control. Things that are important that are going to impact the finished part, the part that we ship to the customer. Because we do not want to ship crap to the customer, right? Customer does not want to pay for crap. Well, unless they're buying crap, but the fertilizer maybe. What do you got? Packaging. Yeah, I'm not going to write that one down. What do you got? Process variables, things that impact the, the value added operations. Yes? Uh, it's just, I think you got it, I just didn't hear it. Oh, yeah, so next week in lab, you guys are going to be doing some 
Uh, lab exercises where you practice setting up the machine. You realize the hardest part about making a part in the CNC machine is setting up the machine, is putting the workpiece in the machine and loading the program on the controller, having it be the program that you intended to load on the controller. That's the thing we check for. Um, and then telling the machine where the workpiece is about all the tools. That's actually the most difficult part of this. And um, next week, you'll be using an automated probing system in the machine to locate the workpieces and to measure the tools. The calibration of that probing system is certainly a process variable. Uh, or that's, that's, the, that's the obvious one. Um, what if the, so you get an X and Y table that move the workpiece around in our milling machine. What if they're skewed to each other? What if they're not actually at 90 degrees? You could work around it in software if you know how much they're skewed. But, um, but that's a problem, right? OK, so calibration. What else we got? Quickly, what else you got? Status of the machine, like how old it is. So how about the status of the tool? Let's say we're making turned parts on the lathe, right? As we're doing our in-process inspection of our turned parts on the lathe, we're doing an OD turning operation. Somebody describe to me what an OD turning operation does. Yes? It removes material from the outside of the spinning part, right? We're doing our OD turning operation. In our in-process inspection, we notice that the part's getting bigger. What happened? The work is not being held correctly. Not like, uh, you would have noticed that right away. The tool's moving, it's, you know, here at WPI, you know we have 1,600 individual users of our equipment. Last year, 1,600 people came in the lab and made something. So here at WPI, that actually might be what happened. Somebody might not have tightened the bolt that was holding the tool in place. And the tool may be getting pushed away over time. But that's probably not what it is in production. Yeah? The tool radius, the tool nose radius is wearing out. So people on Echo are screwed. But I have another blackboard. So let's look at our, our turning here. All right, so here's my workpiece. Let's rotate it this way. Where's the tool got to be? We're going to put the tool down here. Right? So my tool's there, feeding in this direction. Just quickly, what's the depth of cut? Oh, I didn't mean pick a number, but OK, thanks. Oh. We could do 30, though. Uh, so let's call this DO for original. Let's call this D. F for final. What's the depth of cut? Yes. D O minus D F equals D O C as long as we remember to divide by two because it's symmetrical and we're only taking, yeah. All right, you guys got that. All right, feed this way. As the tool wears out, let's say that this is unobtainium 42. And the tool is wearing out as it goes along the workpiece. It's unlikely to notice wear from here to here. But as the tool wears out, so over here, oops, over here the tool was this big. Over here, the tool is this big because it wore out the nose of it. If it's linear, Right, because it's symmetrical. As the tool wears out, the part gets bigger. Probably won't happen in one pass, unless it's unobtainium. Was it 42? Yes. Unobtainium 42. OK, so as tool wears, um, what else happens as the tool wears? Anybody? Yes? Why? I agree. You increase the potential for the tool breaking. Why? Yes? 
There are actually little micro cracks that form in the edge of the tool, but that's not the one I was going for. Yes? The tool geometry changes, yes. It's not as sharp. What happens when the, what do you imagine happens when the tool becomes less sharp? Uh, caught is the wrong word. What's that? There's more load on it. What happens, so where does the heat in the cutting process come from? You know, the tools wear out mostly because they get hot. Where does the heat in the cutting process come from, Sri? Speed of moving. The, the speed of moving, or that's, that's part of it, but. There's more surface area, but yeah, the, the heat in the cutting operation comes from the friction, right? So as the tool gets dull, the cutting force goes up. What's friction depend on? Friction coefficient and what? Normal force, right? So our, as our force goes up, because the tool got dull, there's going to be even more friction, which is going to make the heat go even higher. And so the tool's going to fail because you didn't change it soon enough. Um, what else we got? Status of the tool, what's missing? Um, time of day. Day. We can say day of week. Which day of the week do you think we have more bad parts? Friday. Friday. Why is that? Everybody wants to go home and Thursday was payday, so they went out drinking last night. <laughs> I kid you not, I have friends who have had to go bail out their operators from jail to get them to work on Friday because they had to make production and that was the guy that knew how to make that part. <laughs> it happens. Um, day of the week is important. Um, actually, I did, a, I did a project there with another company that had a different problem. Their failure rate skyrocketed after the Red Sox lost. Day after the Red Sox lost a game, failure rate would skyrocket. You want to know why? Anybody, any guesses as to why? Yeah? Sports betting? No, no it wasn't sports betting. It, it would be nice. It's even, it's even more, uh, yeah, what do you got? The, uh, you know, it, that may have happened, but that wasn't what we determined the root cause to be. It was a visual inspection process. There's a guy named, I don't know, Joe, Jimmy, Freddie. There's a guy that would do this and say, yeah, that's a good part. Put it on the pile. If the Red Sox lost, he was angry the next day. When you're angry, it's easier to find flaws. Anybody ever notice that? That's a bad part. Throw it away. So we replaced. Joe, Freddy, Jimmy, I can't remember what the guy's name was. We replaced him with a laser and, and some light sensors and stuff like that. <laughs> if you move the laser at just the right speed along the part, the reflection would change at just the right rate. And as long as we trained the machine on a day that the Red Sox won, we could get production out. So, so yeah, there's, um, there's that stuff. Time of day. Why does time of day matter? Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, you'd think that, but it's, it's not really on the operator so much. Time of day matters to the machine tool, too. Yes? Temperature. Temperature changes over time, right? Especially if there's a window. If the sun's shining on the machine, the machine will grow. Um, I, have a, I have an operation that I was doing. Geez, we made a couple hundred of those parts. The operation itself took 24 hours of cut time on those parts. In one seven-hour cut, my spindle would grow by a thousandth of an inch. So I had, to, I had to fool the program to make the tool get shorter over time so that my depth wouldn't be too big in the last pass. So, so heat will also make makes metal expand. The, the, spin, the, uh, the mechanism got so hot that the spindle would grow about a thousandth of an inch which is significant when the tolerance on the part was half a thou for height. What else we got? Anything else important? All these things impact the, yes? The weather. Um, yeah, yeah, the weather, the humidity. Have you ever ha tried to dry paint on a day like this? Latex paint does not dry well today. I can tell you that for sure. 
Um, all of those things matter. Now, let's think, we've got a few minutes, let's think about some other manufacturing processes because although these are the processes that we're going to study in this class and we're going to focus on it. By the way, why is it that we do machining in this class? Did we do, we do this on the first day? Why is it that our primary focus is on machining in this class? Anybody know? There's two really good reasons. Yes. Yeah, for some people. Yes. Because in additive manufacturing, you don't have to care about a lot of these things. I would disagree. Um, yes. So that's a reason we want you to learn how to use the machines, but it's it's, it's deeper than that, right? Yes. This is the way almost everything in the world is made. Anything that you can buy right now is not more than two, three max steps away from a CNC machine that did cutting operations. This table, all right, so the fasteners that hold it to the floor, those were cut on a CNC machine tool. The pipe that are fastened down to the floor, that was cut with a cutting process. It was bent. It was bent on a machine that was made by machining parts on CNC machine tools. The wood, well, is it really wood? It's particle board. The wood product that makes up the density of that tabletop, that was first ground up with blades that were cut on a CNC machine tool. It was then stamped together in some sort of a form the parts of that were made with a CNC machine tool. The table, you get, you get the idea, right? It's the most important manufacturing process in the world today, and it will go on to be despite additive manufacturing, which is really good at making near net shape parts, which then get finished machined. Um, what else? Oh, and the other reason was, uh, I forget, it's Gus, right? Yeah. Yeah, Gus. Gus's reason that we want you to be able to use these in future classes and to do your MQP and stuff. The other reason is because we're kind of good at it. And we have lots of CNC machine tools, so it's easy for us to teach you that. So two reasons. One is because it's really important, and two, because we're kind of good at it. Uh, what else we got? Time of day, uh, sunlight, all that stuff. Well, let's talk about some other manufacturing processes. First, Blue Hat. What's your name? Arcadi. Say it again? Arcadi. Arcadi. Girl sitting next to Arcadi. What's your name? Agasha, Arkady Agasha. Agasha, name two manufacturing processes that are not CNC machining. Oh, come on. Somebody help her out. Welding. He says welding. Do you want to name welding? All right, welding could be your first one. What's another one? What do you got? Casting, okay. Welding, casting, what else we got? Laser cutting is sort of CNC machining, but okay. I'll give you that one. Bending, Bending is a manufacturing process. Heart, well, yeah. Heat treating, work hardening, all those things, manufacturing processes. Coating stuff is a manufacturing process, so painting. What else? Yes. Assembly, that we t that's typically when you're putting the chips on the board, that's, that's really an automated assembly process, but yeah. The soldering that holds them to the board is another process. Yes? Sintering. Sintering, yep. You guys know what sintering is? No. So you typically you'll take some powdery material, some binder material, press it together into a shape, and at this point we have a green part. We put it into a furnace, and it heats up, and the molecules melt together, the stuff melts together, the binder holds the powder together, and it becomes a hard part. So a sintering process where you use heat to bind stuff, to fuse stuff together after you've bound it together. Were you going to say anything else? No? OK. Uh, sanding? sanding is an abrasive process, which is very similar to, see, to, uh, to machining. 
We call so we call this CNC machining stuff that we're doing is turning and milling. We call this chip formation by or material removal by large chip formation. Sanding and grinding we call material removal by small chip formation. But it's the same physics in the back end of it. But yeah, absolutely. You had something? Yes, go. Packaging is a manufacturing process. I have a uh, a guy I used to know was the head of manufacturing at Lotus, not the car company, the software company. You guys know what Lotus was? Lotus one two three. It was Excel before Excel was Excel. It's a software company, a, a spreadsheet company. He was the head of manufacturing at a software company. Huh. What did he do? CDs. Uh, it was actually floppy disk time. They put software on floppy disks. They put floppy disks in packages. They shipped packages. There was real manufacturing needs for software companies back in the day. Um, all right, so all of these other processes have their own sets of <laughs> process variables, right? We could, we could sit here and we could do a, a list like this for welding, right? We could sit here and we could do a list like this for casting. What do you think is important in casting? What do you think the most important, besides the shape of the mold that you're casting into? Uh, you guys know what casting is, right? Take hot metal or hot plastic or something like that and pour it into some mold. Um, so the composition of the material is, is important, but what's, what's, what's really important in, in a process where you're pouring hot stuff into the mold? Yeah? Yeah, whether the mold gets destroyed. Temperature differences. Temperature differences, right? So we need the stuff to cool at the correct rate because stuff shrinks when it cools. So we need to control the cooling rate of the material after we pour it in. We also need to control the temperature of the liquid stuff when we're pouring it in. My wife used to be a manufacturing engineer at Tiffany and Company. They had, a, they had an issue. Um, so you know, they don't like melt gold bars to make gold jewelry. First, they melt gold bars and make little like pea-sized pieces of gold so that when they go to make their jewelry, they don't have to um, melt a whole gold bar if they're not using that much gold. That makes sense? So the process of making the little pea-sized bits of gold is called graining. And so when they were graining, well, actually, no, when they were in production, they found that they had problems with some of the gold jewelry. She inspected it. She had to do metallographical analysis. She found out the alloy was wrong. There was too much copper in the alloy. She traced it back to the graining process. And the operator said that might have been the time we melted the thermocouple in the gold. Now, they put a thermocouple in the gold so they'll know how hot the molten gold is because there's an appropriate temperature that you don't want to go over, otherwise you can have other chemical processes happen. That was supposed to be much lower than the melting point for copper. It might have been the time we melted the thermocouple in the gold. Now, that's an operator problem, right? Because if they had said, shit, we screwed up, we melted a thermocouple in the gold, they wouldn't have used that batch in production, would they? They might have sent it out to get refined so that it was gold again instead of too much copper in the gold. Operator problems, they happen. Um, tomorrow, what are we talking about? Anybody remember? Anybody? We're gonna, we're gonna continue this topic, but instead of process variables, tomorrow we're gonna talk about from the process variable that we input into the CAM software, to the machine. We're going to talk about that NC code and that that's gap between the machine and the uh, CAM software. It's very similar to lab one, right? It's lesson one in the CAM. I'm going to go over that kind of materials. Those materials. And if you want to become a graduate student in materials or manufa manufacturing, grab some pizza. Yes. Um, there was one time where my dad had a friend who was from Germany who was like a packaging engineer. Okay. He stayed at my house one night when I had like a big science project due for physics and he came over.